thrilled to have um, a dear friend, Paula Bronstein, who will be presenting, who's got a crazy schedule, but found a way to squeeze us in. So I am thrilled about that. Um, so Paula, it is all you. Share your screen and off we go. Okay, share a screen. So basically you're seeing me and Bucha a year ago. And the reason you're, I wanted to show you this picture is we've already passed the anniversary of the massacre in Bucha and all the war crimes that were committed there. You will see some very graphic photos from that. Uh, this is my second time presenting. And the first time I was very, it was a very focused kind of selection of images uh, from the fall of last year. This time I'm, I'm, I'm really mixing it up and showing you the whole, the whole bouquet, so to speak, uh, all of the images um, in a pretty wide edit. So, and the reason for that is why not? <laughs> so, so this is a, a photo I took again. A lot, some of these photos are just going to be a year ago. This is probably sometime, I'm going to say almost exactly a year ago. In Borodjanka, a suburb of Kiev, uh, and that was uh, hit by aerial bombing. Now, today, this, this the structure you see in front of you on this photo, it's, it's been leveled. Bulldozers came in, the building's gone. Uh, on this day, I was there to document whatever I could. People coming, you know, pe how people are living in Borjanka without proper electricity, water. And it was very spring day and rain showers. And then a bit of sun came out. And I said to my translator, it's going to be a rainbow. I know it. I know it. I'm staying. I'm not leaving here. He said, we got to get back to Kiev. We got to get back to Kiev. There's, there's, there's curfew. Fuck the curfew. I'm staying. And I did. And the rainbow came. And, and, and there were other journalists there, but they did leave. And we, we had a bit of a difficulty getting back into Kiev at the time. I remember, but, uh, you know, I just kind of bullshitted with the security guys. Hey, you know, we had a shoot a rainbow. You want to see it? So, yeah, Paul, rainbow, we shot. So, Paul, you capture that rainbow when you're in the car going back. I, I mean, are you like a kid? I did get the rainbow. I did get the rainbow. I mean, like absolutely, absolutely, fucking lutely. Are you kidding me? You know why? Because let's just start with this war is the most. You know it. it especially a, a year ago, you had everybody, everybody upon everybody there. It was the most well-covered war I've ever experienced in my life. And so if you get something that's exclusive, guess what? You're kind of happy because mm -hmm. not much is exclusive. You're in Bucha. And, and everybody's covering the massacre of Bucha and, and photojournalists are just like racing around with the fans that are carrying the bodies and bringing them to the cemetery. And everybody's trying to get an original photo and you're looking at them going, are you effing kidding me? There's like, you know, I mean, I think there's value to over coverage, but we, are, we took it to another level a, a year ago because when you have such a historical important story it's unprecedented and everybody needs to cover it. And whether on, on assignment or not, they want to be there. So getting back to the rainbow, yes, it was exclusive. And I can tell you, nobody else got it. There you go. And, and I'm not saying that's what I was going for, but I, why not? Okay, move on. <laughs> so this 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 photo is um I look at I purchased this uh I bought a drone. I never owned my own before. And I'm gonna tell the audience that the reason why I purchased the drone is that I felt like there's gonna be a lot a lot of situations like this where you really need a bird's eye view. Extremely important. 
Um, and so with the help of some Ukrainians who were kind of drone geeks in France, I learned very quickly. And I felt like that's cool because I'm in my 60s. Why can't I learn? You know? Yeah, I, yeah and, and everybody has drones, okay? And, um, and, you know, I would say both wires and uh, all publications are used to photographers having that option, you know, that potential option. If it's, if it's something, you know, like some big, big, you know, some unexpected shelling that's have it happen in Slovians or, or whatever, you know, you need to have it. Because if you're allowed to drone, if, if it will go up, it, you know, you're going to get the shot. Uh, and, 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 um, Paul, are you easy with taking on new technology like that? Because that's so new for you to like all of a sudden now I got, I've got a drone and, and all the hardware. Exactly. That with that. Yeah. Yes, I am. And I did it because for, for a couple of very, very important reasons that I stated, I felt like I need to be able to have an aerial view when I want it. Uh, the way Russia is operating in this war is just constant. There's just no end to the destruction. And as everybody's very used to seeing, um, you're going to see it from the air. Now, uh, lots of times it's difficult to use it. Um, you can't always drone. You have to get permission. Uh, and and you can't do it anywhere near the front line as you can imagine. So this photo that we're looking at is from Airpin, and it's from, you know, you've got these incredibly what used to be incredibly uh, kind of average middle class apartments with with, you know, Airpin is a very very nice suburb of Kiev, and as you can see, it was complete. You know, this section. Not all of your pin. This section was really hit hard. So uh, this is my first time shooting Zelensky. He came to Kherson after it was liberated. And um, just did a little bit of a Hail Mary and grabbed him. <laughs> yeah, and Paul, do you get the sense when he's with all these military folks, he has the, the stature that they all respect him, you know, like the way we think of an American president or a chancellor. Right. You know, like he, he's there and he has a presence? Um, he has a definite presence. I knew he was coming on that day. We were with a press tour. And we knew he was coming. Uh, but they wouldn't confirm it. Absolutely. But, uh, you know, I was able to get to the wide angle, to be honest. I felt pretty lucky because his security guys are, are kind of ninjas. You know, they, they don't fuck around, as you can see. <laughs> yeah, they're they're surrounding them. So I was just happy I got the wave, that's all. Um, now we're seeing there's a, there are refugee trains, and this one is one of the many that come from the east, and you have um, a mother holding her children as she, you know, she's crying because her friends and relatives had come on the train to, 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 to greet her. And then they had us all say goodbye. And she was headed to Lviv. She was headed to Western Ukraine and then to Poland. This is just one of the older pictures from Irpin, from the bridge that was destroyed. Uh, the border by Poland, when I first got there. The only reason I got this photo is I came late because I was in Afghanistan. And uh, I mean, late meaning the airport was closed, the war had started. So I was in Afghanistan and I flew to Warsaw and then met the reporter uh, for the Sunday Times. And we traveled in a humanitarian bus over the border. And this line was going on forever and ever. And the only way to get it, obviously, is you're coming in. Otherwise, you you can't you can't possibly get it. So I shot some pictures from the bus really quick, and then they let me out to shoot some more. More saying goodbye. 
the uh, car cemetery in Irpin and a very small, beautiful child looking at the, the, the destruction of cars. This again became kind of a war tourism spot. <laughs> um, why did they pile the cars up? I don't know. I mean, there was all this destruction in the airpin and they they just decided to kind of create more or less in, you know, a scene where people could come and observe. And again, it became a war tourism spot. This is a very important funeral. I've covered so many, but this is a very important funeral in downtown Kiev for an activist who was killed a, a lot of no a lot of soldiers that have been killed you know none of them were career soldiers they all came from different walks of life and some are very famous and they just wanted to be part of the war effort and of course paid the paid the ultimate price and uh, so this was a very emotional day and when when there's very important people people of people who are known in the community. Uh, sometimes Lenski shows up, but it's always in the center of Kiev so that they can really have a proper memorial. And this is the same situation. And now we're jumping to Cher Chernihiv and to a woman who had lived in her house for over 50 years. And this is what's left of it. And another woman in her 80s. Uh, I've done a lot of work with the elderly in Ukraine. This woman uh, was a child in World War II. She was probably five in World War II. She actually lost her eye then. And so she talked to us about it. She talked to my translator about it and what it was like going through this war. But the amazing thing is when you look at her war-torn face, you can't believe she actually lost it as a, you know, in the in the World War II. Mm. Yeah. Uh, we have a drone shot of a cemetery, a Kiev cemetery. And these flags are only in the military sections of the cemetery. So, and, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, Paul. So, so this is um, this is the cemetery. So, the um, uh, these are all the graves. I mean, and the caskets are already in the ground. It's hard to, to exactly. See. So, okay, yeah. what you're seeing are, you know, yeah, there, there's. The new graves are at the top of the frame. They have not been buried yet. Wow. The 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 all of the others are, and this is all military, have been buried. <laughs> so they they usually have uh, I don't know six to ten graves already dug, waiting for the next funeral, mm -hmm. and then we go to a drone shot. Also from European. It's quite kind of, I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, it, to me, it's how else are you going to shoot this, right? It has to be from a drone. And now we're moving to uh, the, uh, when I came back for uh, doing a variety of anniversary stories for different clients. This was for CNN. And um, they wanted to do the weaponizing winter story, which means, you know, what had started in the fall and carried on into early, kind of early winter was, was uh, the infrastructure that was, that was hit and, and how was Kiev doing with these, these sec, you know, what was going on is what you see in this picture. Directly in front of you, no power. In back, power. And so that's what they had to do. Turn off, turn on. That was the only way they could, that the city could manage the power to have enough. And Paul, when you go for a CNN or, or, or the Post, do they give you direction? Or is it go to this city, go here, go there? 
It's just go. It's go. It's find the pictures. Okay. I had to find this location. We did a recce. We, I told my fixer what I wanted. But we have to show how this is. This is across the river. It's in the left bank. So it, it's across the river and it's very, very congested. As you can see, a lot of high rise apartments. And it was the only place you could show power off, power on, because that's what was happening. There were schedules at this point. People knew at 6 p.m. the power was going to go up. 9 p.m. it'll come back on. Another neighbor neighborhood, it's different. So the only way to show this is I was, this is not a drone shot. I was on the 32nd floor of an apartment building. And I'd gone there before and I had my fixture find out, tell me when the power is going to be off. That's when we're going. And it has to be after 6 p.m. At this point, of course, that's, you know, you know, for it was all timed. I had to go up there at night and I had to know when is the power going to be off in front of me. So that's how I, that's how I did it. And then very long exposure. Not very long, but, you know, a second or two. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, just lucky we were able to get up there because we just kind of acted like we lived there, just kind of <laughs> walk right in and take the elevator up because I knew, I, I already knew that we could get this for you, but we just had to time it. You follow me? We had to yeah, time yeah. it. Yeah. We had to know when is the power going off. So, so, so that's so all this, regulated. That's all regulated. All the residents know this is when it's coming. This is when it's going. You know, at all, that point, at that yeah. point, it wasn't that way in the fall. It became very organized by January. Like, like residents knew the timing. They knew when the power was going off, what the schedule was, so they could plan. They could plan how they cook their meals at home. They could plan. It was perfect for them. And they adjusted very well because they're Ukrainians. <laughs> and in mostly because, you know, and restaurants could plan. And, and everybody had generators at this point, everybody. But, you know, you can see for the apartments, it's a little tougher. They can't, it, they have to put a generator on a balcony and maybe they don't have one. It's not as easy. And we have, uh, a woman holding her kitten in the shelter uh, in northern Kharkiv. She, I mean, we're talking about, you know, below the building. So that's where most people were living to keep safe. As you all know, that was happening all the time. And more uh, power outage stuff. I would say, you know, and for me, this was like going into someone's home, you know, meeting them outside, finding out, is your power out? Okay, can we come in? <laughs> Not that easy. You have to have very nice Ukrainians, like this woman. And Chernihiv, we have the owner of a house cleaning up the debris after shelling. More of the same in Kharkiv. So these pictures, of course, this is Kharkiv again. Kharkiv is the second largest city has got, and has had incredible amounts of uh, shelling. Schools, shopping centers. This is a school that, got, that was hit. Very large, well, it was college, sports college. Kherson in the early days uh, when people were lining up for humanitarian aid. And this was outside of Kramatorsk. Um, I'm just gonna go forward to this picture and go back. So this woman, I met this woman on the street. We, we knew there was we got the location of where the shelling was overnight. And uh, we finally found the neighborhood and we found this woman wandering around kind of dazed. 
And, uh, and then she said she had already been treated and released at the hospital. And then she took us into her, park, her home where she had lived for many, many years. And there she's gesturing saying, why us? Why, why did they hit the small house? And we stayed with her for about well over an hour. Otherwise I wouldn't have gotten these photos. And again, in terms of exclusive, you know, there was no one out, no other media there. Small town, nobody would ever go there. I went there. Yeah, I mean, it's almost the, the, um, the conflict within the conflict, right? To find the exclusive images with so many journalists being there. Oh, right? there's so many. There's so many. But if you are going to some small town, that you know has been hit overnight. Um, you know, once you get there, maybe two or three houses are damaged. It's not a huge story, but you can make it into something that is meaningful by st st staying with the people and really spending time with them. You're gonna, you know, I spent a lot of time with this woman. So she would talk to us and we would get her story. It's not easy. I'm showing now a number of uh, war wounded kind of portrait images. This woman was raped and I was working for the Sunday Times and we did a story on her. And she told us her entire, the entire situation, how it happened, when it happened, where it happened. And that was very unusual. So at that point in May or June of last year, all the media were going after the rape stories. I hate to make it sound kind of mainstream, but they were all going after the rape stories. Like, this is an atrocity. We have to document it. We have to, you know. But, but it became a feeding frenzy for the media, unfortunately, especially because it's rape and it's a very sensitive story. So at least I, I was working with a, a female reporter. So at least I felt like as women, we could kind of, at least we were relating to her on a, in a way that she felt that she could trust her. Another child in a hospital and Kind of moving on to more military. This is from a very recent photo I took at a training. Well, Paul, yeah. just, just one, one issue, I mean, which will sort of be um, compelling as they move along. Like, uh, I know that's a, a situation, I think, um, Jonathan, I forget his last name, uh, did in, um, in one of the African nations. Same thing is going to happen here. Some of those women are going to get pregnant. Uh, this is correct. And what do they do? I mean, so like from a social. This is correct. Well, if you look at the story on the Rohingya, which I covered right. extensively. What I mean, there are a lot of pregnant women. And they didn't have an uh, they didn't have abortion access. They're in the refugee camps. Mm. They had their babies. And, and yeah, the, the Rohingya is a whole different extreme. We can't get into that on, on this talk. Right. Yeah. Uh, 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 in, in, in Western European countries, the women are going to have much more sophisticated. They're going to have access to abortion, to be quite honest with you, if they do get pregnant. And not so for right. the stateless, the stateless, the unwanted, the Rohingya. That's not going to be the case for them. Right. Very different. Very yes. different. So you think... You think most women will have an abortion, even though it's a very Christian nation? Well, I can't speak for them, but I know. Obviously, yes. Yeah. Why would they want to? Why would they want to bring a child, not a, a child, into the world that they don't want? Right. Yeah. You know. You know. Forget it. So we're getting. I just wanted to mention. So kind of going into the stories I'm doing in the military and the war wounded and you have to understand you know working in afghanistan for a couple of decades i was mostly focusing on civilian uh civilian casualties um you know kind of the innocent silent voices of, of war that you know 
I, I constantly was trying to cover them. Uh, in Ukraine, I'm covering the military. And so he's a new recruit. And I started photographing new recruits because it's very important right now for Ukraine to be training the new recruits. So that was just at a training. And he's, he's, he's a, the amazing thing is that, is that he volunteered to be in the demining uh, group as a soldier and obviously paid a very, you know, he had, he, a mine went off and, and his, the whole right side of his body. And so with, with very severe facial scars and, uh, and so I started photographing. This is this is very recent. Both of these, I just I did it before I left. So uh, just just two and a half weeks ago, I started shooting them. So they're kind of subjects I'm going to be following. This this particular man, I want to I want to photograph him. Go back to the rehab facility in Western Ukraine and continue to follow him. So I, I kind of cherry pick handpick different subjects that I want to focus on that are all different stories. And as I said, that he was a D minor and volunteered into that battalion, you know. Now we're getting two photos from Kramatorsk Hospital. Uh, I spent, uh, I embedded there and spent almost five days there. Um, and uh, it was extremely difficult to get access, and I had some connections, and I was I was able to to start working there uh, with total complete access into the operating rooms, et cetera, et cetera, into the emergency room. So that's what I was after. That's what I was used to working in Kabul, and I I was able to get it. But I don't think anybody got the access at this hospital. So it was just, um, I just used my connections. There was also an American doctor working there who was a friend of mine, so that helped me too. Again, it's just a, how do I tell the story? I have to have the access. And the wounds are really horrific, so you have to show it. You have to show it in the operating room. And as you can see, there are Probably we we're about to amputate that arm. You know, the traumatic in injuries, this is what the soldiers are going through. If you don't show this, how do people know? And I can, for me, I can handle this because I got, I, I quite frankly, I got pretty used to the horrific traumatic injuries that I saw in Afghanistan from improvised explosive devices and mines. And in this case, it's mostly shelling and mines. Mines are becoming much bigger issue. It's not bullet wounds. And Paul, how, how do you deal with you know, going through all this yourself, you know, for your own mental state? You know, after doing this for a number of weeks at a time, being in these hospitals and, you know, what do you do to recover yourself? Um, I don't need it so much. I mean, it's very difficult to see some of the injuries, but it's not, because I have a lot of experience from Afghanistan. It's, 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 it's easier for me to witness it. I can't say that it would be the case for others. I can't speak for other media, but for me, I, I worked in emergency hospital in Kabul many times. And again, there are mass casualty situations that I had to cover from, from suicide bombings and stuff like that. So this was coming, it was a bit similar because the soldiers are getting shelled and there's nothing worse than that. It really isn't. And I like covering the doctors and nurses at these hospitals because they're working their tail end off. They are such wonderful people and they're, and they're military. So this is in a city hospital in Kramatorsk and, and some of it's 
Some parts of it are military, only caring for the military. So now we're moving on to a prosthetic center. And again, we go from, you know, me covering the war wounded, the amputees to prosthetic. So it's all kind of part of the same theme. Yeah, so Paula, I mean, those mines, I mean, the Russians are leaving them when they leave. And then when the Ukrainians walk, you know, come into those new areas that they've recaptured, this is when this happened, right? Well, we know from the history of war that there's always mines are, are one of the most destructive things that are left behind, right? Yeah. That's with every war. That's not just this one. Right. And there's still mines in Cambodia from the Vietnam War. Mm. So, yes. They do. Uh, Russians will leave butterfly mines. The tank mines are very large, uh, but some mines are much smaller and harder to detect. Uh, in Afghanistan, it was worst case scenario where actually a number of journalists were, you know, lost, lost limbs, uh, you know, going on patrol with U.S. soldiers in Afghanistan. Uh, and, and one soldier would step in the right place. Maybe the photographer behind him would step in the wrong place. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, this is Pasha, another subject of mine that I hope to continue. And uh, this, he he was a single amputee. Now this leg you're looking at, he was in so much pain that he, um, the doctors had to amputate this leg. So when I get back, I hope to be able to see him and continue that story. I lost access to him once he was in the back in the hospital for the second amputation. And I did try to intervene in terms of like getting telemedicine from the States to, to, to try to get some second opinions and stuff before the leg was amputated. Anyways, it didn't work. I tried though. I tried to, um, you know, and I sent his x-rays to doctors in the States to try to see what they thought, but it wasn't, you know, I do what I can. Mm -hmm. And hopefully he's just going to be better off in the long run without, he had really too much pain on this leg. It was, mm -hmm. it was very, it was constant pain. I'm probably going to have to speed it up because we're already at a quarter up. Yeah, that's what that. And this is an, these pictures are it's a variety of locations that I shot a rehabilitation for wound soldiers, the recovery, how, you know how how the, the the they're just such amazing people, you know they're they're so motivated to try to just to try to be able to walk again to build their bodies up again. And this is Misha, uh, who's extraordinary. He's really a bodybuilder. He's he's been in Orlando, Florida, for the last few months, getting his prosthetics, and he's probably going to be heading back to Ukraine any day now. Um, but again, you know, these super athletic guys that are ready to just, you know get back to their life and, 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 and they're just real motivators for other soldiers as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. This is still, it is a true script. This is in Western Ukraine. We're getting to Bucha here. So you're gonna see some more graphic images. I might move through them fairly quickly because they're kind of hard to look at to be quite frank. <laughs> but, Again, we just passed the year anniversary. I think it's it's important to show them in this projection. Are these Russian soldiers, Ukrainian soldiers? Do, do you know? I do know. These are Russian soldiers, Russian soldier, uh, civilian. I mean, you know, this is a man, a man's body that was lying on the side of the road and Nobody had picked it up yet. And a destroyed shopping center. It's on the Airpin Butcher line. 
This is actually Kupiansk. Kupiansk, Russian soldier. Uh, forensic police uh, who were, you know, around a year ago going, there was a constant job to exhume the bodies, examine them, and detailed reports for war crimes for, for the, for, you know, they have to, they have to, as you can imagine, I think you already probably know this, but just for the audience, you know, Ukraine's done an amazing job at cataloging every yeah. single war crime, you know? And so obviously they're looking at the wound, they're gonna take pictures, examine them, catalog it, and make sure that every human being who was tortured uh, will be, you know, they're gonna make Russia accountable. Let's put it that way, right? Yeah. And this is an Zoom. Uh, they had, they had to, they had to dig up about four hundred something bodies, four hundred fifty bodies, four hundred sixty bodies, from this one cemetery in Exum. So, so yes, I did that with drone. <laughs> That's the only way I could get the shot. And this is in Bucha. The wife of her is standing over her husband's body. And back in Izum, digging up the many, many bodies that you can see here. Uh, hundreds of hundreds of graves exhumed. Back in Bucha, uh, we all we know all about it, but just seeing the photos and documenting the war crimes is extremely difficult. But you have to stay focused and you have to try to make sure you're getting the photos you need because you know these war crimes have to be shown and have to, you know, this was one location in Bucha. There were many, many locations, but this was probably the most graphic location. So I apologize for the, the content, but this is, you know, Russian military left their garbage next to the body and they were beaten. They were they were shot at point blank range. They were, their hands were tied as, as you saw with plastic tape, whatever they had, power cords, whatever they had. This is, this is all Bucha. Although some of the, the other graves were back. Yeah, this is Bucha Cemetery, Bucha Cemetery. I mean, that must be uh, incredibly difficult to get access to that also, huh, Paul? No, uh, no, a year ago it was not. It was no. not. Well, I mean, it was more being there at the time when things were happening. Mm. They weren't stopping us from getting access. It was finding, to be honest, a lot of media at that point were chasing vans that had number 200 on it because those were the vans that had bodies and because and they knew they were going to go yet to another house, another house, another house to, to, to retrieve a body. So this is a photo I took quite recently. Um, and when we were talking about the rainbow, to me, it's kind of similar because it's somehow I was able to illustrate something that I wanted to that I never imagined I could. So you're talking about something really difficult to look at and how do you, how does it happen? You, somehow for me, the luck was the sunset was so incredible. So this is Kharkiv Cemetery. And I wanted to illustrate that the cemetery was filling up. I tried to drone it. I wasn't allowed to take off. And then I told my fixer we're coming back at the end of the day. And um, let's see how it goes, but I'm gonna have to get some shots standing on the car and um, see what we can do. And then kind of, you know, the clouds were really awesome. And I just said, you know what? I think it's gonna be a really nice sunset. Let's stick it out. And that's, and I got the picture I wanted. It ran double truck and Perry match. Mm. It, didn't, it didn't even end up on Getty, but 
the editor from Getty called me and said, uh, Perry Match wants this photo. You haven't sent it to us yet. I said, no, I haven't. They saw it on Instagram. Uh, but it was exactly the mood I wanted because it was meaningful, it was poignant. And uh, and again, the beauty of nature mixed with the the tragedy of war. That's why it was so important. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. We'll probably have to speed through this because we are running late. Mm -hmm. We are running late. <laughs> I have to go. <laughs> I'm gonna cruise through this. This yeah. is a very important picture. Yeah. Yeah. This was a funeral for a bombing victim in Kiev. It was a very small church outside of Kiev. And the light was streaming through the window and bouncing off the cross in his face. And I thought, and I, when I shot it, I, what, I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that, that's just amazing. That's just amazing. Yeah, it's, it, I, I no words, right? No. Anyways, obviously it's entitled Enlightenment. <laughs> yeah. It's just you can see the window. There's another big window behind him. The sun's oh, coming right. through. But the fact that it was hitting the cross and okay. then bouncing back to his face. And it was just, I was the only media at this funeral. So again, we bring up the word exclusive, right? Yeah. 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 There's no one else there. Yeah. The same funeral. It was the crematorium that I that I started doing the story on in Kiev. I, it was about a year ago, because all of these coffins were full. They couldn't keep up. This is a funeral for four soldiers. And Paul, speak to us as you go through them. When are you planning on going back and you know, on and on? I'm on. going back. I'm going back early next month. Um, okay. I've shot dozens of funerals. So if you go back to this, back to this. What are you? They're all, they're all funerals. That kid looks they're so all very, beautiful. they're all heartbreaking funerals. Every single one, every single one is heartbreaking. And sometimes you have, this is Kharkiv, you have amazing clouds, the mood changes, the weather changes, and then you get different images all the time. Mm. This is a very recent image. So this was shot the same day as the sunset. So it's just, I shot it like, what, two and a half weeks ago. And on that day, there were five funerals back to back. And another reason I had to shoot these was because most of the soldiers were dying in Bakh Bakhmut. I, I need to try to illustrate that. So now we're in Kharkiv. Yeah, and I thought it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, some of these you saw. So I can breeze oh, yeah. through these for you, but I mean, your your, your no. viewers will see. How did that sunflower grow? Yeah, it was watered. <laughs> but how it started to, who knows? I don't know. I don't know. Like that's the other young girl, right? Little boy. Yeah. It's in the heart key. You know, Ukrainians get back to living their life as they always do, right? Mm -hmm. Against the backdrop of war. And some military training pictures. I kind of like this because it's kind of like a painting or something. I don't know. They're always vaping. More military training. You really have some incredible access, my God. 
Well, the military training, we just have to get permission. This is actually an image from the Kromatorsk Hospital. I just put it with the military training pictures. But it was a, from a, a military got into a car accident. <laughs> I'm gonna have to, but we're gonna have to wrap it up because yeah, yeah, no, I know, running. I know, yeah. It's... All right, so you go back in a few weeks, uh, mm -hmm. and how long do you plan on staying for? Um, or you don't know when you go. These last images are going to be from the Lviv Ballet, which I'm not sure I showed you before. No, I don't think so. Yeah, I, I did a feature on the Lviv Ballet around a year ago because they just started performing again and. It was super important to document them backstage. They're incredible. That's got to be a pleasant experience for you to to do this, right? I mean, to get a little relief. My God. Yeah. No, no, no. I love doing features like this. I love it. And, and does your editor, do they like say, let's give Paula this one. She needs a break. I mean, is there No, this is my idea. Okay. I knew the, the ballet was starting up again. I wanted to document it. Ukrainians, you know, they're doing so much culturally while the war is going on, and you have to show this is what they're doing. Okay. You know, it's very important. So that's that. We are at the end of the projection. Wow. Wow. Well, thank you so much for um, so much for doing that, um, for coming in. You know, always last minute and always. Pushed on the schedule. You could stop sharing if, if you want, but um, that's really, really, you know, just just wonderful work. And you know, we, you know I know that everyone, um, as we're watching this, you know, prays for your safety and the safety of all the photojournalists covering the stuff that we really all need to see. You know, as tough as it is to see, and um, we admire your your courage. And you know, you know, you you have the last words for the evening, as always. Please. Yeah, I'm so sorry to rush offline. Normally, I would love to take Q&A, but we just ran late tonight. Uh, but but thanks again to you, Frank, for doing what you do. And uh, I'm happy to take anybody can email me, message me on WhatsApp. You've shared the information, yes? Yes, absolutely. Um, um, Instagram, I mean, all you know, you can always get in touch with me and ask me whatever you want. It's perfectly yeah, no, fine. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and thank you very much in giving us, you know, the big picture, you know, from mm -hmm. ballet to funerals to burials to er everything. It's um we we all need to, to see the the, uh, the courageousness of these people and, and, and for what you do. And you know, of course, um, Paul, you have a standing invitation to come back whenever you're ready. <laughs> um okay. you, you know, so you you're okay. always fine. thank you very much. Thank you.